Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. And uh, so I'm going to give you a talk about the immune effect, immunological effects of psychedelics. Um, my, as Dominic mentioned, my background is in, in neuroimmunology, and uh, my main field of research is basically psychoneuroimmunology, which is basically about uh, the interactions of uh, mind, brain, and the immune system in health and disease. Uh, but I've been also interested in uh, psychedelics for about 10, 12 years now. And uh, the way I actually ended up researching psychedelics about 12 years ago was because I, during my PhD years, uh, I, my research was focusing on serotonin and uh, the effects of serotonin receptor signaling in, in uh, uh, immune functions. Now, as you may know, serotonin has... Uh, you know, a lot of uh, important functions in, in human physiology from regulating cognition and mood uh, to uh, also regulating, for instance, blood pressure, uh, hunger, um, and many other things, including immune functions. And now, serotonergic psychedelics uh, basically uh, can be classified into two major groups, and they share a common indole, indole be, uh, ring uh, or a common indole structure, which is very similar to serotonin. I twist it around a little bit for you so you can see the similarities between the structure of serotonin and DMT here, for instance. For instance. Now, one of the major groups of uh, psychedelics is uh, so-called indole alkylamines. Uh, this is a large group. Uh, uh, there are in interesting members such as psilocybin or tryptamines here. And also there is another group which is called phen phenylalkylamines. Uh, they have a little bit different structure, but what is common in these compounds is that they have an important affinity. They have an affinity towards serotonin receptors. Uh, now, these serotonergic psychedelics, or you know, many of these psychedelics are naturally occurring and are present in, in all the three major kingdoms of, of life in the, in the biosphere. Uh, and they've been used by indigenous uh, cultures for centuries, even millennia. And they can also be synthesized in the lab nowadays. Uh, but what is common is that they can, they catalyze this uh, kind of uh, profound alteration uh, in, mind, in the state of mind, uh, can also uh, cause mystical experiences which probably underlie their uh, psychotherapeutic efficacy. Now, in my talk, I'm going to be focusing on the immune system, which is uh, a very ancient system um, uh, and its main role is to protect the biological self from invading pathogens. It has basically two major arms. One is called innate immunity and the other is adaptive immunity. And uh, I'll be focusing on innate immunity uh, since this is the uh, aspect of the immune system which uh, is basically operating with or through inflammation. This is also the very first line of defense uh, which is always there. Uh, this is what protects us from, from invading viruses and bacteria. And uh, these beautiful cells of the innate immune system are everywhere in the body. You are everywhere in the tissues, they are circulating in the blood, they are monitoring, constantly monitoring our tissues and, and looking for uh, infectious agents. Uh, this is what we call immune surveillance. And when they bump into uh, bacteria or fungi or viruses, then they uh, get activated and they produce a class of uh, molecules, technically they are uh, yeah, small peptides, and these are called uh, cytokines, uh, more specifically inflammatory cytokines. Uh, and now, these inflammatory cytokines are regulated by many things in the cells. I'm not going into that uh, today, obviously, uh, but I just wanted to draw your attention to one of the factors that are very important, that is very important here, it's called nf kappa b This is one of the uh, master switch, is, if you like, this is the master switch uh, uh, that basically controls the release of inflammatory cytokines. Now, this is how it uh, goes when, when it comes to inflammation or when it comes to infections or elimination of infla infections. Uh, so these cells, immune cells, are, as I said, constantly monitoring the tissues, when they bump into, uh, uh, they detect bacteria, for instance, uh, close to a wound, wound they uh, detect them and start to produce the inflammatory cytokines, and then these cytokines are then causing the symptoms of inflammation. So, increase in vascular diameter, increase in, the, in permeability, and then this is leading to basically the five typical symptoms of inflammation, such as redness, swelling, heat, pain, and loss of function. Now, 
Unfortunately, uh, <laughs> unfortunately uh, so uh, th this uh, can go all right as well. But it is important to keep in mind that the inflammatory response is absolutely crucial, you know, in, uh, in uh, getting rid of invading pathogens and necrotic tissues. Uh, it, is also, it also has a very important role in mediating, uh, basically, uh, uh, wound healing and tissue repair. And there is a subtype of inflammation that I wanted to mention today. It's called sterile inflammation, uh, which is basically happening in the absence of pathogens. So uh, it's happening when, for instance, our tissues are exposed to chemical or mechanical stress or trauma, uh, UV radi radiation, high temperature, and so on and so forth. And then this is leading to the release of so-called uh, damage-associated molecular patterns or damps by our own tissues. And these damps can activate the immune cells as well. So we can have inflammation, you know, in the absence of pathogens. It will be a bit important later on. Uh, uh, I'll get back to it later. So this is how it looks. Uh, this is basically the kinetics of an inflammatory response. The onset is pretty rapid. We all know how it goes. Um, it, may, it takes usually minutes, maybe one, two hours, and then there's the resolution of inflammation and the healing of the wound, which takes typically one to three days, and then we get back to homeostasis, you know, get back to normal, basically. This is what we call uh, adapted homeostasis or immune homeostasis. Uh, unfortunately, it can also lead to uh, a maladapted homeostasis, and then the person, the individual may develop uh, chronic inflammation or autoimmunity. Normally, the resolution of inflammation, basically, is a very complex uh, phenomenon or process. I just wanted to uh, mention here a small uh, set of cytokines, which are called anti-inflammatory cytokines, okay? So it's another group. We had inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines, and one of them, for instance, interleukin-10, is one of these cytokines that mediate, uh, that basically limits inflammation and also mediate, uh, mediates uh, the healing of, of the wounds, of wound repair. Now, acute inflammation can be transformed into chronic inflammation if these pathogenic signals or self-tissue-released endogenous signals break the threshold of immune to tolerance, and then this is leading to, may, can lead to autoimmune diseases and many other things. So if it's happening in the brain, for instance, then uh, can contribute to uh, uh, malfunctioning, significant malfunctioning. And it's pretty well established nowadays in the biomedical paradigm that inflammation plays an important role in, in many neuropsychiatric disorders. For instance, it's been linked to uh, all the uh, symptom domains of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, for instance. Uh, also, mood disorders such as major depressive disorder. And uh, this master switch that I mentioned, nf kappa b uh, and the dysregulated production of inflammatory cytokines by peripheral immune cells have been very strongly associated with uh, symptom severity of depression, for instance. Also, inflammation has a very important neurodevelopmental aspect. Uh, maternal immune activation uh, basically, which mean, basically means uh, infection during pregnancy uh, can have a, a huge impact on uh, embryonic and fe fetal brain development. It can basically interfere with all the, virtually all the stages of, of uh, fetal brain development, from neurogenesis to synapse formation to gliogenesis. And uh, we know that we see that in, in many disorders, many psychiatric disorders, such as autism spectrum, ASD, autism spectrum disorders. So this uh, shows the importance of immune modulation in the therapy of neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, now, as Dominic mentioned in, in the intro, unfortunately, the physiological effects, you know, when it comes to psychedelic research and psychedelic therapies, uh, it's basically 99% about brain imaging, psychiatry, uh, clinical psychology and stuff. This is very, very important. I'm not, I'm not downplaying the importance of this, obviously. However, unfortunately, we, do, we don't really understand the actual physiological effects, biochemical and biological effects of these psychedelics. And so uh, my research is focusing on this. Uh, there are many groups who, uh, a couple of, well, not many. It's pretty, uh, unfortunately, there are a couple of groups that are also uh, doing uh, research into this field. Uh, for instance, the Nichols Lab, uh, uh, who've been doing uh, groundbreaking work, absolutely pioneering work uh, in exploring uh, the immunomodulatory effect of a 5-HT2A receptor, serotonin 2A receptor. Uh, also, there's the Rehans Lab in Brazil, um, who uh, also like, published a very important, crucial paper on the uh, anti-inflammatory effects of 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine 
through uh, serotonin receptors, specifically through 5-HT2A and 5-HT2C, and also another receptor which is called sigma-1. I'll get back to that later. And also we can find some sporadic papers or studies on the anti-inflammatory effect of NDMA, for instance, by, by the Connor Group in, in Ireland, for instance. But it's really a blank slate, so it's really kind of a, 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 you know, a field that needs to be explored. Now, there are a couple of models that uh, yeah, have been proposed regarding the anti-inflammatory action of psychedelics. And uh, this model was proposed by Nichols, uh, which is basically about the uh, inhibition of inflammatory pathways through 5-HT2A receptor. It basically means that when, uh, when cells are ex uh, exposed to, uh, let's say, psychedelic tryptamines, then uh, uh, this can modulate inflammatory pathways in a way that it, this nf kappa b again, the master switch that regulates inflammation, you remember, is blocked, so the inflammatory action is blocked. Uh, this is a, another model uh, was proposed by me a couple of years ago. It's a bit more uh, inclusive. Uh, this uh, includes also many other receptor pathways and downstream signaling pathways. Uh, and it's basically about what we call in biochemistry uh, signaling flux redistribution. So there, when, so there is basically a crosstalk between these pathways. And uh, to put it in layman terms, layman terms uh, you know, if you trigger two or more receptors at the same time, including those that are also involved in the recognition of microbes, for instance, in the body or dams in the body, then you can have, you, can may, you may achieve a better anti-inflammatory effect. And besides the intracellular effects, there are also important uh, intercellular effects. Uh, and we know also from these sporadic studies, mostly in vitro and animal in vitro studies, that some of the immune cells that are crucial in autoimmune disorders and inflammatory disorders can be modulated, their action, their activity can be modulated by a handful of, of psychedelics, serotonergic psychedelics. Uh, now, as I mentioned previously, uh, psychedelic tryptamines uh, also uh, exert their action through the sigma-1 receptor. Uh, so obviously here from a Immunological perspective, serotonin 2A and serotonin 1A are very important. But besides those, sigma-1 is, is, is a, or has been a candidate that may mediate these anti-inflammatory functions. So this is kind of an elusive receptor. It was originally termed as, a, as an opioid receptor. Now it's an, it's an orphan receptor. Uh, it's expressed by many tissues in the body, from brain to gut, liver, vascular endothelium. And it's, uh, it's located in the cells, somewhere here and uh, here. So between mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum, uh, what is important here is that uh, this position uh, shows that it, this receptor is very important in mediating anti-stress reactions in the cell. Now, our studies uh, back in between 2010-2013 was originally focusing on uh, this receptor, and we wanted to see if this receptor is expressed in immune cells, immune cells that are crucial in mediating inflammation and in bridging innate and adaptive immunity, such as monocytes and macrophages and dendritic cells. It's not really important here today. Just wanted to show you that what we found was, yeah, these cells do indeed express the sigma-1 receptor. And what we found uh, was pretty exciting because, and it's interesting, because when we activated the cells using bacterial signals, mimicking bacterial infections and viral infections, we got this consistent pattern that we saw significant decrease in the level of uh, inflammatory cytokines and uh, increase in the level of the anti-inflammatory IL-10. And uh, we also set up a, a model in which we actually used uh, pathogens, e, e. coli and influenza virus, H1N1 type virus. And in, in this case, we looked into uh, um, uh, cell types that are involved in adaptive immunity, T cells, helper, so-called helper T cells, those specifically those helper T cells that are important in, in chronic long-term inflammation and autoimmune disorders. We also saw that DMT and 5-MeO-DMT both blocked the activity or overactivity of these cells pretty efficiently, by the way. Now, the next step was, obviously, we wanted to see to what extent uh, does sigma-1 receptor contribute to this effect. So we basically genetically modified cells. We knocked down this receptor. So we basically generated cells that did not have 
the sigma-1 receptor. And when they were exposed to DMT or 5-MeO-DMT, we didn't see that effect that we saw, quite, not quite as, as we saw in, in, in those cells that, that uh, expressed the receptor, which showed the absolute importance of sigma-1 receptor in mediating the anti-inflammatory function of dimethyltryptamine and 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine. To take, take a step forward, we set up an animal model, a rat model of stroke, and uh, it was a pretty complex study, so due to the lack of time, I'm not going into this. We also, uh, it, it has like many facets from uh, uh, the anti-stress effect, anti-stroke effect, and uh, neuroprotective effect of DMT to the anti-inflammatory effect of DMT. So today I'm just focusing on the anti-inflammatory effect here. So in case of stroke, one of the most devastating aspects of stroke is basically the subsequent neuroinflammation, which is happening after the stroke. This neuroinflammation uh, neuro is basically contributing to a large amount of tissue loss in the brain parenchyma, uh, mostly because of the release of inflammatory cytokines, again, through the same sensor, same biochemical signaling system, and nf B, you know, the master switch, and inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-6, interleukin-1, and so on and so forth. IL, in this case, in general, it's easy to remember. Interleukin means between leukocytes, between white blood cells. This is basically the language, the common language that you know, Im immune cells speak. And these are involved, as I mentioned, in, in inflammatory regulation. Now, what we saw when we uh, uh, used this stroke model was pretty interesting. We isolated, actually, so after the sacri sacrifice of these animals, we isolated brain samples and uh, then we performed genetic and, and uh, serum marker analyses. And we found that uh, DMT, those animals that were treated with DMT during the stroke and after the stroke, uh, they did express significantly lower levels of these inflammatory cytokine genes and high levels of the anti-inflammatory cytokine genes. And this was also pretty much consistent with the serum findings. So these, these same factors show the same pattern in, uh, in the serum of the, of the animals, which was uh, pretty, pretty uh, very, very interesting and very uh, uh, astonishing for us. Uh, to take another step forward, we also set up another um, uh, study. It was a small cohort study, an observational study, which was based, uh, uh, established by Malin, uh, who is here with us today, and then we'll give a talk tomorrow. Um, so it was a small field study where we had 11 participants, who inhaled five, a large dose of 5 methoxydimethyltryptamine. We collected uh, saliva samples before and after of the session. Uh, it was about one and a half, two hours after the session. And then Malin was kind enough to send me the samples on ice, and then I, uh, I could perform the analyses. And what we found was a significant decrease in the level of interleukin-6, which is one of the you know, the crucial, the most important inflammatory cytokines. So it basically reflected uh, an immunomodulatory effect and an anti-inflammatory effect, uh, together with increases in the level of cortisol, which is consistent with the uh, uh, sympathomimetic effect of 5 methoxydimethyltryptamine So the conclusion is today is, or the take-home message, if you like, is that certain allergic psychedelics uh, hold a great promise uh, for a wide range of therapeutic applications, which include autoimmune disorders, neurodegenerative disorders, as well as many neuropsychiatric disorders, and therefore the physiological underpinnings of their action or the very uh, the research into the very bases of their therapeutic action is highly warranted. And finally, I'd like to thank all my colleagues and friends who've uh, uh, provided me with invaluable help over the last couple of years. Thank you very much.